Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Karen. And... uh, Donna C. and I celebrate the same sobriety date, 10 years apart, but uh, the same date. So she's and Diana are gifts in my life, as, as are all of you. Now, Alcoholics Anonymous is uh, the most important thing I've ever had. And actually, it's the only thing I've ever stuck to, including a marriage. So there's something about AA that uh, keeps me coming back because I keep learning. You know, and it's everything I've ever wanted. I found in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and when I got here, I didn't even know what I was looking for. So it's, there's magic. There's absolute magic in these rooms. And I continue to find it. And uh, I never get tired of uh, listening to you and learning from you. So for that, I truly, truly thank you. So um, I'll stick with the format. Now, I hear some speakers say... Uh, I'll tell you what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. Well, that isn't actually what the book says. The book says what we were like, what happened, and what we are like now. Because, you know, it doesn't change. We do. And uh, I can certainly attest to that. So um, before, I, uh, before I get into that, I'm, I'm going to tell you my pee story. <laughs> I really don't think you can have too many pee stories in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> so if you don't have one... You were probably in a blackout and don't remember. So I had several. But this was one actually uh, occurred in, uh, in sobriety. It's not mine, but uh, I finally stopped doing that. But um, I was living in San Francisco at the time. I actually got sober in Southern California and about four and a half years was transferred up to San Francisco. And people used to ask me, like, gosh, aren't you afraid to go up there, you know, with the wine country and everything? And I'd say, well, I I would worry if I thought there was enough. But there was never enough. So that really wasn't uh, wasn't a challenge. So uh, one Friday afternoon, I was coming back across the bridge from Marin. And for those of you who have ever been, somebody shared earlier that they were in San Francisco. Yay! All right. Yeah. There is nothing so majestic or breathtaking as when you come across from Marin into San Francisco, you come through that tunnel, and you've got this panoramic view of the city, the bridge, you know, the fog. I mean, it's, it's magnificent. One Friday afternoon, and the traffic is always bad, but this Friday afternoon it was unusually bad, and I was in the left-hand lane, and there, there is no shoulder when you come through the tunnel there, and there was a car right on the edge like a foot from traffic. And we're like inching along, and this car is sitting there with a hood up, and I see the people in front of me, and I get upside that car, and they're looking over, and they give it one of those, and I'm thinking, what in the world? And I get up alongside, and I look over, and there is a guy standing there with his dick in his hand, (laughs) peeing on his engine. like this far away, and, and my first thought, right after I thought, whoa, I haven't seen one of those in a while, was, I'll bet this is alcohol related. Huh? You know, here it is, Friday afternoon, you've had a few beers, the car overheats, i uh, piss on it, you know? you're going to do, right? And I I understood that perfectly. It was like, and you know what I love about Alcoholics Anonymous? You guys get it too, you know? I could tell that same story at the office, and people would be going, ew, oh, gross, you know? We get each other, you know? We so get each other. And that was just such a classic example of untreated alcoholism. And I get that, too, because I was an untreated alcoholic for many, many years. So um, for those of you who are new, if this helps you at all, please take it home with you. But I use what I call my little three-by-five note cards. 
And I try and remember, not try, I remember the three most pitiful and incomprehensibly demoralizing things that ever happened to me when I was out there. And I keep them real close, right in the front of that little file drawer. Because if I've got to look for them, it takes too long. And since it only takes from here to here for me to be out, I don't want to take any chances. So any time my head lies to me, and it still does, you know those famous lies, oh, well, I wasn't that bad. Or, well, maybe one wouldn't hurt, some wine with dinner, flying in an airplane in a foreign country, and that doesn't count. The, the incredible lies that my head will still tell me. I will immediately go to my little file drawer and say, you know, I don't think a normal drinker was arrested five times for alcohol and drugs. I don't think a normal drinker spent her wedding night in jail. (laughs) And I don't think a normal drinker was thrown out of the Plaza Hotel in New York City for peeing in the lobby. Uh, But it was done with grace and dignity. I tell you, it's an ama- it's been an amazing journey, needless to say. Because even after my uh, my third arrest, came back to Florida and decided I probably need to get married. So I found Mr. Wrong, and uh, we spent our wedding night in jail. And uh, then, as many of you women I know will relate to, I needed to set a good example for that alcoholic husband because. He had a problem with alcohol. And why should I be denied? Right? Coming home from work, why should I be denied a cocktail? Because he had a drinking problem. So, my best thinking said, then keep your vodka in the bedroom. In a shoebox. Underneath some stuff. And I saw no problem with this kind of thinking. I am hiding vodka, because he was drinking too much of it anyway, hiding vodka in the bedroom, getting home from work, filling my glass up with, I used to drink diet, Pepsi and vodka, filling it up halfway, walking in the bedroom, glug, 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 filling it up, and walking out there and setting a good example for that alcoholic husband. Because I knew he was my problem. And if I could just get rid of his sorry ass, I would be fine, thank you very much. So I stayed with him for nearly seven years because he needed to be punished. <laughs> ah, it's a wonder he survived it, I swear to God. Um, finally divorced him in uh, 1989 and got a transfer with my company out to California. And uh, I thought my problems were over. It was a new decade. It's 1990. I love new decades. You know, clean slate. Start fresh. Here I had left that sorry-ass alcoholic husband in Florida, had gone out to Southern California, new job, new house, new, new decade, and I didn't know what the problem was. And I can never find a solution if I don't know what the problem is. And I still thought it was him and you and my boss, and if you had my stress, you'd drink too. And I wasn't out there nine months before I was popped again. Because now there was no one to set a good example for. And of course, I gravitate toward people who drink and use just a little more than I do. Because then I can point to them and say, they have the problem. And if I ever get that bad, maybe. Actually, I never did say that. (laughs) I never thought of quitting. It was never me. I spent my entire adult life figuring out ways to blame everyone else for my problems. It was never me. In fact, toward the end of my drinking, the depths of the denial of this disease and the heights of arrogance that I had climbed were were so mind-boggling that this last time we'd actually been playing softball. And I've been drinking since about 10 o'clock in the morning, and now it's about 7 in the afternoon and evening. And I'm driving home, and 
this old lady pulled out in front of me. She shouldn't have been driving. You know? (laughs) She shouldn't have been on the road. So I just clipped her fender. It's perfectly normal. And again, the denial was so strong at that point. I actually waited for the police to get there so I could tell them it was her fault. Well, it didn't take the police very long to figure out whose fault it was. And once again, taken out of my car, hands behind my back, I am taken to jail. My fifth arrest. And I couldn't believe it because they didn't understand it wasn't my fault. That old broad shouldn't have even been on the road, for God's sake. Thank God, this time I was sentenced to Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I wasn't grateful at the time. Because I came to these meetings so angry. You know, because you just kept saying stupid things. You know, you're talking about how it's the first drink that gets you drunk. And I think, well, then you don't drink like I do. It's five or six before I even get a a buzz. And then you talk about how grateful you were to be an alcoholic. And I think, oh, hon, you're just brainwashed. It's a cult. And how sad for you. (laughs) And here I am on a six-month court card, showing up to get my card signed. And doing everything that an untreated alcoholic does. Yeah? Driving. Driving on a suspended license. Driving drunk on a suspended license. All the insanity that goes with it. And angry that you people were so sad. And when you talk about how grateful you were to be an alcoholic, I would think... I wonder how grateful you'd be if I stuck a pin in your eye. (laughs) What is wrong with you people? Jesus. Couldn't believe it. But you know, I always loved the meetings. I always loved the meetings. There was something so magical. I I get chills now. And it was that laughter. That laughter that I just heard. And it was the magic of, of seeing somebody literally crawl into the rooms. You know, so broken and so beaten up. And a couple weeks, they get little roses back in their cheeks. And a couple more weeks, they got some friends and then a little job. And then there's a God in their lives. And you see their lives start to change like I'd never seen anywhere else in the world. And I couldn't deny that you had something that I wanted. And I was scared to death of that thought. I couldn't imagine life without alcohol. I mean, how do you go out? How do you talk to people? How do you have sex? How do you do anything without alcohol? You know, I always say I'm amazed at people that can get sober before the holidays. Because I couldn't even get sober before Super Bowl. One more kick-ass party, and then I'll try this thing. But I still, even though I'd been sitting in the rooms for five months, not sober, but absorbing. I went to the Super Bowl party, still not truly understanding the problem. I really thought that being a sober woman meant learning to drink without getting drunk. So when I went to that Super Bowl party, I swore to myself I wasn't going to get drunk. But not understanding the problem, I did not know that there was no amount of alcohol that I could safely put in this body without totally losing my power of choice. So, sure enough, had a few, had a few more, ended up on somebody's couch, went into work the next day, sick as a dog, miserable. And then that Tuesday, I actually had, this was in Southern California, had to go up to L.A. for a work event. We went to a a Kings hockey game. But since it was for work, I couldn't really drink the way I like to drink. And I, I'll never forget, I had two big cups of beer and couldn't even catch a buzz. It felt nothing. It was like water. And something clicked. My head realized 
what that part of chapter 3 that you read. When you talk about the great obsession of every abnormal drinker being to control and enjoy his drinking. And on Super Bowl Sunday, when I enjoyed it, I could not control it. And at the hockey game, when I controlled it, I couldn't enjoy it. And I knew then that I was an alcoholic to the bottom of my toes. And something in my head said, why bother? I have no idea, where that, but I know exactly where that came from. But at the time, my head said, whoa, where'd that come from? Because my head would have said, if you can't catch a buzz on two, then have two more. The very next night, I went to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous for the first time. And I sat in a chair, <clears throat> very similar to these uh, cold metal ones, and you know, everything on the wall, the mottos and the traditions and the steps. Because when I used to get tired of listening to you guys, I used to read the walls. And I bet I had read that first step a hundred times. This time I read it. And I just, the most pure prayer I have ever made in my life, I just said, God, help me. And it wasn't the typical, God help me, and I promise I'll never do this again. God help me, and I promise I'll da 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 da. It was just total surrender. God help me. And magic happened. I mean, I literally felt the presence of God in that room, sitting on that cold metal chair that Wednesday night. And I took the first step that very minute. Went home that night, and the second step happened to me because I went home and for the first time in so many nights, so many years of nights, I did not have to open that cabinet and get down that jug of vodka. So many nights I swore I'm not going to drink tonight. And before I knew it, I'm standing there in front of the refrigerator with a glass of ice, filling it half full of vodka thinking, tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. Tomorrow never came. And that night, and from that night to this night, I have not had to open that cabinet or take any mind-altering drug. 17 years on the 7th of February. And actually, my real not-drinking date was the 25th of January, but... uh, I did smoke a little marijuana after that. Uh, I didn't, I swear to God, I didn't know it counted. <laughs> and I probably had about 60 days when uh, somebody, I was sitting in a meeting in, in Southern California, and somebody came in and shared that they had lost six years of sobriety. They'd been over in Las Vegas and smoked a joint. <gasps> I said, oh, damn. You mean that counts? <laughs> and I changed my sobriety date. Because a friend of mine said, you know, you've got the rest of your life to take chips. You only have today to be honest. And that has stuck with me ever since. So I changed my date, started over, and uh, continued on the path of continuous sobriety since September 7, 1992. In my first six months of sobriety, I was tested. <laughs> Uh, I lost my career due to the wreckage of my past. Had my heart broken. In fact, he broke up with me on my last day of work. <laughs> Couldn't you have timed this a little better? <laughs> had my house robbed. Had a cancer scare. And lost my house. And the magic of these rooms, the way you carried me, the way the women just surrounded me and carried me through... I knew there was not one thing that any of that, including the broken heart, would a drink make better. Wouldn't bring the job back. Wouldn't bring the man back. He had four years. He was a god. You know, would, wouldn't change anything else that had gone wrong in my life. And what a gift that was. Losing everything made it possible for me to see that nothing could make me take a drink. And I know to this day, the only reason I will pick up a drink, there's one thing, because I want to. 
because nothing can make me pick up a drink. And the minute I give myself any excuse at all, I have just destroyed everything that I know is true. There are no excuses. None. Other than I want to. And I don't want to today. It's going too good. It's, it's incredible. Um, about four and a half, I went up to San Francisco. And um, just because I kept suiting up and showing up, I was returned to the career that I lost because of my alcoholism. My pay doubled, literally doubled. And I got to live in the most beautiful city in the world. It was uh, an amazing gift. Got real involved in Alcoholics Anonymous. Real involved in Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, lived there for 10 years, which is the longest I've ever lived anywhere in my life. My dad was an alcoholic too. (laughs) And we moved a lot. And I never understood what that was about until I got sober and learned about geographics and the power of this disease. And this disease is stronger than a mother's love for her children. My God. It, it's, it's powerful. And there is no graduation. I know that all I have is a daily reprieve, and that's all I will ever have. You guys have taught me about a God that I never had as a child or in any other way. A kind and loving God. And I know in the third step, you know, I mean, I came to believe in the second step, but for me to truly be able to turn my will and my life over, I've got to go beyond belief to trust. And that's big. I mean, believing in God is one thing. Trusting in God is something else. You know, it's like that story about the guy that's walking along the mountain and he falls into the chasm And he grabs onto this branch, and he looks up, and it's dark. He says, there's anyone out there? Help me. Big voice booms out. God saying, my son, I am the Lord. Let go of the branch. And the guy says, is there anybody else up there? (laughs) You know, letting go of the branch. it, It gives me chill. I mean, this is huge. For me to finally let go of the branch and know that God is going to take care of that and everything else in my life. And I worked real hard on my fourth step. I wrote like like a research book. And it was this huge thing that, you know, I took like, I, I took a class on, you know. And I mean, it's like, and the book says we share in a general way. You know, we look at the seven deadly sins and, you know, that pretty much covers it. No, I went back to things in third grade. You know, people I didn't even didn't even know me who had hurt my feelings. Oh, jeez. And uh, sat down with my sponsor to my fifth step, and um, it was long. <laughs> and at one point, she reached over and she goes, "You know, like how many more pages are there?" <laughs> and at another point, literally, she rolled her eyes back in her head and said, "God, so many men." I said, that, that hurt my feelings. I said, Peggy, I don't think you're supposed to say that. And then she told me some of her stories, and still, it hurt my feelings. And, um, and we were doing it outside, this is still in Southern California, and we're doing it outside, and all of a sudden, it um, started getting dark. So we finished under a street lamp by a fire hydrant, literally. And we did six and seven under a street lamp of the fire hydrant. <clears throat> so my fifth step was not this, you know, walking the arch into freedom. I mean, this initiation that people talk about. I didn't have that experience. But what I did learn, it's not about the experience. It's about the power of the steps. I was willing to share everything with another human being and with my higher power. And even though I didn't get this, you know, the wings and the music, and it was what I took the action. And this is a program of action. 
This program isn't, there's no chapter, you know, on into thinking or into feeling, but there's a program into action. And that's really what, uh, what that fifth step was about for me. And six and seven, I, I miss them. I mean, I have come back and revisited six and seven, which to me truly are the most powerful steps that we have. And they're so overlooked, at least sometimes the first go around. And when I, to me, six and seven are like the third step on steroids. You know, this is when it really kicks in. This is like, I use a sailing analogy. When I'm really in six and seven, when I'm truly in God's will, that's when I get to decide just how happy I want to be. And it's like having the wind at my back if you're in a little sailboat. And man, when the wind is at your back and I'm in God's will, that thing just books. It just goes. But sometimes, you know, the wind isn't quite right, you know, so you can tack and go this way and then that way, and you're still going to make forward progress. Then there's that other time, even though I know that six and seven work, when I know that God's will is the only way, I will still stand there with that little handheld fan in the face of the wind going, come on, come on, we can do this. Come on, no, no, come on. And then I remember, no, I can either take... God's will or Karen's will. And the only thing, the only thing that works for me is God's will. So I got into eight and nine, you know, made my list, made my amends. In fact, you know, they say you make them when, when you can. I was working with my sponsor in Las Vegas and, um, doing some more eight step work and, and there was two people from high school that I thought maybe I owed an amends to. And, but I thought, oh, geez, it's high school. She'll give me a pass on that. So I went through these, and because, you know, more is revealed. And she goes, oh, no, you've got to make those. And one I actually made when I was driving cross-country last March from Las Vegas to here, driving with the parrot and the cat. It's like the Okies and the Arkies going cross-country, I'll tell you. <laughs> and stopped in southern Illinois and made one of those amends. And the other one I got to make this New Year's Eve. This gal came down with her husband. Her daughter actually lives in Tampa. And they came down, and I met them for dinner, and I had an opportunity to make a 40-year-old amends. That, That just takes my breath away. So the blessings. Just keep on giving when I'm willing to do the work. You know, and the 10th step, that's the one that keeps me whole. You know, because I so don't do this perfectly. (laughs) You know, and the 10 step amazes me because when I think how Bill Wilson, you know, this wrinkled old white guy, knew my heart, you know, almost 70 years ago. And because he knew an alcoholic of my type, you know, when he said, when we're wrong, promptly admit it. Because he knew, left to my devices, even if I'm wrong, if I wait 24 hours, well, I wasn't that bad. And in 48 hours, it was all your fault anyway. So, promptly admit it, and if I think I own amends and I'm not sure, I'll err on the side of making it. Because I can never go wrong by doing that. And I can go way wrong if I withhold one. Because those, I call my little shit chips, and they start to pile up. You know, when I, went, I let one go, and then another one go, and before I know it, I can't see over the top. And right after that, that's when I have to take that drink, because it's just too painful. Okay, 11 step, this is when I get the power back. You know, I give it away in the first step, and then in 11, when I pray for knowledge of his will, not understanding, knowledge of his will, and the power to carry that out. Man, then I got the wind in my sail again. That thing is just booking. So I get this power back that continues to change and transform my life. And I get to share it with the women in this program. And what a gift that is. Because the 12th step is not not an option for me. It's a mandate. It's the thing that keeps me here. It's the thing that makes that ugly, dirty life that I brought to all of you 
1992. Worthwhile. I'm not sure I could live with some of that stuff if it weren't for the fact that I can now use it to help another woman get sober. And what a gift that is. What a gift that is. And as Andy mentioned, you weren't supposed to say anything. I, um, I'm very blessed to talk about the ultimate 12th step. I, uh, I have a big, a, bleh, bleh. I have a story in the fourth edition of the big book. And, uh, it is the ultimate 12th step, truly. Um, and, um, I'll tell you a quick thing. Actually, we all have a story in the big book. I mean, <laughs> mine's on page 62 as well. Um, but I will tell you a quick story, um, because it's so amazing to me. Before I left for Las Vegas, great AA in Las Vegas, I always believe the more the temptation, the greater the recovery. And there's lots of temptation. <laughs> but there's temptation everywhere, you know, absolutely everywhere. I can find it, you know, if I was in Saudi Arabia, if I was looking. So, uh, so just before I left um, San Francisco to come to Las Vegas, a gal that... Uh, I had known, asked me if I'd have coffee. Her name was Kimberly. She was 27, a young attorney, cute, 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 and she wanted to share with me her story. She had come to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous about a year and a half before that, and she'd gone to, uh, remember the dry dock down the marina? The woman's meeting, yeah, on Friday night at 5.30, great woman's meeting. And she'd go to that meeting, she had, she had a pretty good feeling she's probably an alcoholic, but she got there and uh, we were just having too damn much fun. Uh, she didn't fit in at all. She didn't feel right. It was like, oh, who are these women? Ew, stop hugging. Ugh. But she did buy a big book. So she got home and, you know, she didn't really want to read the first 164 pages, but she just decided to open it up to the stories. So she just opened the book randomly and read this story called Crossing the River of Denial. And she said that that, at that moment she knew beyond any shadow of a doubt that she was an alcoholic and that she needed to be an Alcoholics Anonymous. She totally identified with that story. Then in about a year, you know, when we get this delusion of wellness, you know, we start thinking, you know, oh, I got this, I know this, I no problem, you know. I wasn't that bad, you know, that famous lie. Um, so she did, there, was, there was a meeting, it used to be on Union and Steiner, which is a really, really crowded neighborhood, well, they're all crowded neighborhoods. But there was a young people's meeting on Tuesday night. So she had already made up her mind. If she could find a parking space, she would go to the meeting. If she couldn't, she was going to go to the bar. Well, pulls up. And, you know, because in San Francisco, if you've ever been there, you do make life-changing decisions based on parking places. You have to. You have to. You, nobody does a U-turn like people in San Francisco because they saw a spot. You know? She pulls up in front of Union and Steiner where there is never a parking space. And there's a spot right in front of the meeting. So she walks in. The young people's meeting. The speaker that night had never been to that meeting before. I am not young. And I was up there telling my story. And Kimberly recognized it as the same story that she had read when she randomly opened the big book and read it a year and a half ago. And once again, she knew who and what she was and that she absolutely belonged in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And again, this, this story, that's not about me. That is a story about God. And the kind of dots that God connects in our lives. What are the odds? I had never been to that meeting before. There was a parking space out front. And I told the story that she had read in the big book. Amazing, amazing gifts. And it is. It's a gift that just keeps on giving. And I am so grateful to be able to share that with you tonight. Thanks for letting me share.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.